Did anybody have any questions on that? All right. Bring our PowerPoint back up. So just tonight, what we're looking at is pretty much everything is a reoccurring project except for item L, which is the peer reconstruction in Gloucester County. Um, we also have a number of, of fishing event coordinators who have called in or this might be their first time with WebEx, so I feel it would be as patient as possible. Um, I know two of them are not able to attend. One of them is already sent. Mr. Elliott on the Eastern Shore lives in an area with um, not the best internet service. So I have sort of a thing to read for him that I've put in our PowerPoint. Um, so if, if somebody isn't available, we aren't going to be as strict as we might normally be about attendance for this meeting. I have told everyone if they try to log in and can't, please send me an email. Hey, Alicia, can I just share a question, please? Certainly. Go ahead, Ed. All right. I'm going to ask it during the work session. I won't ask it during the regular meeting. Uh, with all the unallotted items that uh, the General Assembly took out of the budget, um, has there been any discussion about increasing the cost of the fishing license? No, not to my knowledge. Okay. I'm just asking. I know, I know it's there, I know it's available, but it's going to be interesting to see what they do with the uh, unallotted stuff starting uh, next week. I can't imagine that it be, will be reallotted, um, but I don't have any information on that yet. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, um, was that all you had, Ed, for now? Yes, ma'am. I have one more slide for sort of my things. and So I wanted to give you all as board members an update on where we are just for 2020 and all of the things that have happened. Um, all of our research and access projects that are ongoing that were approved last year have found some way to work within the social distancing guidelines. I mean, they, they were definitely hiccups along the way, but all of that has moved forward in some way. Um, however, the fishing event are different. That's a lot of people in a small location. So seven of our eight events have already canceled. Um, they're in differing areas of turning their paperwork in and not, but that's okay. Um, the last one is the Virginia Beach English Club and the Seton House, and they still may cancel. They're looking at other options right now, but they're the only one who really hasn't made that final call yet. And I know that it was asked a few times every email, but if an applicant cancels the event, they're just asked to return the funds if some of them have not asked for the funds yet, so they never got them in the first place. And they need to submit a final report that just, just says, you know, canceled due to COVID and to describe any funds they have used. Now, there may be a few clubs that, that have used, I know of one, used funds to order things very early on, like January. And if they were used, Either it's a loss report, it can't be used again, and that has to be included in their finance, final financial report. Or in the case of, I know, um, Great Bridge, they purchased hats, and those can be used in 2021. So their plan is just to return the funds they have left with a report, and then they'll be changing their 2021 budget in the next few weeks. So that's how we're moving forward with everybody. Um, it's not a one size fits all for each group because there's very differing sizes and things that they're offering. But that's how we've been moving forward with everyone um, with all of this, because plans are pretty much impossible at this point. They've already asked a little bit about how to plan for 2021. At this point, we can't really advise them. And, and we also can't advise them on safety. So they need to follow the governor's guidelines. And that's what we can give them. But if they are uncomfortable, even within them, you know, we can't we can't determine what their group can or can't do. So that is up to the individual applicant to decide. But I believe that is all for me. Did anybody have any questions? Can you, uh, can you send us those slides? Yes, I can send you the whole PowerPoint. Thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing.
just long enough to check our attendees. I know Mr. Randolph was trying to call in and Mr. Stevenson has called in. Mr. Randolph, are you on the line? Yes, I am. We can hear you. <laughs> All right. Now I've unmuted you, sir. If you have any problems, just give me a call on my cell phone and I'll um, try to work that out for you. But you are unmuted through here. So if you need to mute, you'll have to mute through your cell phone. Okay. Mr. Rhodes, did you have any other updates? Otherwise, I can chat a little bit about artificial reef if you would like. Yeah, do that, please. I don't have anything else. Okay. We actually got on and got working faster than I expected, so that's great. Um, so the reef program had you know, also faced a few cancellations and delays, just like everyone else with, with COVID. However, we have had two cable deployments this year to the Triangle, and that's the um, offshore cabling vessel that sort of works with us every time they're moving in and out and have a good amount of tonnage in their tanks, so to speak. And that's the armored cable. And we're trying to get that sort of piled up on other locations to that were that were placed last year so that we can sort of have larger piles out there since they are not super easy to find. Um, things are also moving forward with the HRBT construction. Most of that is with our habitat division right now, being that they're the ones who are really working with with the contractors on sort of the bigger thing. They have cleared with us what they can provide, which location, so we are ongoing with that. And I expect once that gets started, that's going to be a pretty huge amount of material and effort with the reef program. We also uh, had been working the last few years to try to figure out who owned Bayshore Concrete. Since there was a lot of material left on that, that's in Cape Charles. And McGann Contracting has purchased the site and has started working with us to donate some of that unused material. So there's a lot of concrete um, girders and other things that were left on the site when Bayshore closed. And we've already, Ethan's already been over there once and inspected a load of material that we're hoping sometime in the next month or two they'll be ready to deploy. That will go to the, the Cherry Stone Reef just because that's a close proximity to where they are. After that's done, we may see more deployments from there. We're going to try to keep working with them. So we have a few things going on with the reef program during these closures, and we've got a couple things coming down the line as well. Alicia, I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, did you say that the cabling was going to go to the Triangle Rex? Yes. Okay. Um, does that that site not have enough uh, material on it? And could we use that material somewhere closer in, like adding it to maybe the tower reef or or some of the uh, inshore uh, areas? The Possibly with the tower, I haven't tried the tower. I did try to get them to put material last year onto Blackfish Banks, which is right off of Chincoteague. Um, the Problem is, I think there's some depth issue. Their captain was a little uncomfortable moving in there. Being that this isn't purchased material, it's donated, we try to do sort of what they, we need to get a location sort of on their way out. So I can investigate the tower. I'm not sure we could do any of the other sites because once they get past a certain amount, 
once it gets past a certain distance from shore, we're not really supposed to know where they're going. And there's a that's really the only site they've offered to us. But I think I can definitely ask them about the tower. Thank you. Certainly. But to answer your question on the triangle, as far as enough, um, yes, there's a lot there, but there's also a lot of empty space as well. So, I mean, we won't get into the situation on any of our sites, um, except possibly the one in the James um, of anything being full. We have plenty of room basically everywhere. Okay, that answers my question, thank you. All right. Anything else? Not that I have at this time. Hi, Mr. Stevenson, we did see that you're on. And I'll make sure I get to you at your presentation unless you had any other questions. Okay. How do I mute this so you don't hear the noise in my house? I you mute, I'm gonna be muted, muting you for you, but um, you probably have to do it on your phone or on your screen. If you move your mouse to sort of the lower left, there's a mute button. Hi, Suzanne, I see you on as well. Hello, good evening, everybody. Those of you who are online and um, as attendees that will be presenting, I'm going to go ahead and shift you all to participants or panelists so that you can mute and mute. Just make sure you check because sometimes it will unmute you when I make that change. Hi, Dr. Fabrizio, I saw you logged on. You should be able to mute and unmute yourself now. Hello, yes, I'm here, thank you.
Hey, Alicia, it looks like uh, Suzanne is on there as well. Yes. She said hi. And those of you waiting, I'm just um, trying to make sure that everybody who's trying to get on can get on before we start at 6 p.m. Thank you all for your patience. Hi, Mr. Anderson. I'm going to switch you over to a panelist so that when it's time for your project, you can unmute and mute yourself. But could you say something so we can make sure we can hear you? Are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Ah, wonderful. Okay, I'm going to make you a panelist just so that you you have the control of muting. Thank. You. All right, Alicia, I got to the clock. Sounds good. All right. All right, let me pull up the presentation. 
Do you want to say anything to the group before I cover your face up? Yeah, we need to get follow the agenda. Yeah, so I'll call them okay. in the order if it's according to my TikToks in the in my office at six o'clock. And uh, welcome everybody for our first virtual meeting. So this this should be not only interesting but probably fun at times. So um, if we go by the agenda, we've got, um, I don't think, I think everybody knows everybody. Um, Alicia, any announcements you want to make? Um, just a few. Let me bring this slide. Okay, so thank you everybody for your patience. I know this is not what we're used to. Um, so I had comments. I know we talked a lot about using the chat function or it was noted in all of the materials that went out to you. I am trying to make everyone panelists as they come in if I know they're gonna be speaking. But if anyone is listening in who had planned to talk or who had not planned to talk or I haven't changed you, um, unmuted you yet, please just send me a chat using the speech bubble at the bottom of the WebEx. Just make sure you type in your name um, if it wasn't already registered and which item you wanted to speak to. Also, just please note, um, if your event has been canceled, I know a lot of you have been great about getting me the reports right away, but please do remember that we still need a final report. It can be very brief, but it just needs to describe that what was canceled and why. Obviously, um, it's a pretty big, easy why. And a check to return any unused funds payable to the Treasurer of Virginia. And please do mail that to Debbie Corker at VMRC just to make sure it gets to the right desk. And that is all the announcements I had. Okay. There's a little bit of a delay in PowerPoint, so it's it's getting there. Give it just a moment. Mm -hmm. Come on, PowerPoint. There we are. All right. Um, Debbie, uh, you want to report on the status of the fund, please? Sure. I'll do that. Um, the cash balance of the fund as of 630, 2020 is $4,201,244. The funds reserved for currently approved projects. And FY 2021 support costs, 3,062,363. Projected funds available for projects, 1,138,881. Okay. Thank you. Any questions of Ms. Parker from the board? Hearing none. Right. Uh, minutes were mailed out, emailed out to me um, this week or late, late last week. Uh, hopefully, everybody's had a chance to, re to review them. Um, as Alicia said, uh, I need a motion and a second to approve the minutes, but we have to do a roll call vote, and she's going to be in charge of that. So, all right. All right well, I get a motion by Mr. Randolph, second by uh, Ms. Payne to approve the minutes as presented. Go for it. All right. Mr. Rhodes. Yes. Mr. Holland. Aye. Mr. Jesse. Yes. Mr. Tack. Yes. Ms. Payne. Yes. Mr. Randolph. Yes. Mr. Southall, I believe, has not joined us. Ms. Whitmore. Yes. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. All right. All right. First item. We all ready? 
right. Item A, uh, 2021 Knights of Columbus Annual Kids Fitting Day, Jim McCadden, $7,500. All right. Is he, is he with us? I believe he is on, or he was on. Let me see if we might have lost him. Mm -hmm. All right. I don't know that he is on at this time. He might have had some trouble. Um, he did provide the slide to sort of update his projects. If you all have any questions for him or his event, I'm happy to email them to to him after the meeting. Okay, when when you send the slide presentation, uh, we talked about it earlier, would you include this also? Please? Yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah, there'll be this presentation and we have three others that'll be separate presentations that I'll send out to the board. Okay, um, item B, Hope House and Oak Grove Nursing Home Fishing Excursions and Clinics, Joe Stevenson, and I've seen him there, uh, $2,900. Mr. Stevenson, it's all yours. Was he on? He is on. Mr. Stevenson, I don't see you. Oh, there you are. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Just barely, but we can hear you. All right, let me talk closer to the camera now. Hello. Go ahead, sir. Okay, uh, well, uh, we had, uh, this year we closed our event. Uh, we couldn't get those people to, uh, we didn't think it'd be safe. So, uh, this coming year, we're going to talk. Uh, I'm used to doing it this way. Uh, I'm to say is, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Go ahead. And you heard what I said? Uh, I want to say Bits and pieces of it. If you want to try it again, make it a little, make it short. Uh, yeah, I want to say hello to everybody, and uh, this is something new to me. Also, uh, I had one of these things with a doctor, but it was just one on one, and it seemed to work okay. But uh, I hear an awful lot of noise on my phone. That might be why uh, you guys can't hear me very well. Uh, we uh, had to cancel. Both of our events this year. Uh, we did spend some money before the events got canceled. We're going to uh, send uh, a, a report to uh, Alicia to tell her about that. This following year, we're going to subtract whatever we spent this year for the following year, and uh, we're going to. I'll send a new uh, 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 form. Uh, what, what we're going to need for this to come here. Uh, uh, do you need me to say anything about our event? Uh, I, I don't think so. I think we're all familiar with it. Um, has, has, the, um, has the nursing home had any uh, issues with the COVID-19 this year? Uh, they didn't tell me that one way or the other. Uh, we, we, when we called, they, and I talked to them, I told them we were going to cancel the event because there was no way we could uh, do this uh, uh, the way, you know, be, being separated with everybody in mass on our pier. And uh, they, didn't, they didn't tell me about any of their patients. Okay. That might be a topic for discussion later on. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can get in touch with them and ask them about that. All right, the, the key to it is, Joe, is that we want to keep everybody as safe as we can. 
even though it is outdoors and we have to keep the social distance thing, um, I know it's going to be hard for the chaperones to keep that distance. So we're just going to need to come up with a plan or, or just see what we got going uh, as we get to your event. Is that okay? That sounds like a plan. All right. Thank you, sir. And thanks, Thank for, you. thanks for joining us in this in this uh, new technology era. Okay, item C is um, Virginia Beach Anglers Club, New Shelter Children's Fishing Trip. Uh, David Anderson, and I see your smiling face right in front of me. Thank you very much, sir. Um, it's definitely good to be seen. So I'd like to give the uh, the board an update on this year's event, the proposal submitted for next year said the seventh annual Seton Youth event, and hopefully we can still keep that. We were originally set to have a heavily modified version of our event this past um, August 1st. However, a couple of days before that, Governor Northam brought us from phase three down to phase two, which unfortunately made it impossible for us to do the event as we planned. Um, our hope is certainly to schedule sometime later in the summer or in the fall because we still really would like to have an event for these children. Um, I imagine most if not everyone is familiar with the Seton Youth event that we've been doing for the past several years. But just to briefly reiterate some things, Seton Youth Shelters caters to, to um, very at risk, very vulnerable, very needy um, and very unfortunate children who their parents or parent are incarcerated. And unfortunately, even in the world of the coronavirus, that is still happening. Um, so these children are certainly in need of positive experiences so that they don't have um, a similar outcome in their lives as their parents. So the normal event that we do, and assuming that we are able to do so next year, based on coronavirus, is we take children out on a headboat fishing for a day we then bring them back for a picnic, a raffle. We give them prizes, rods, reels, tackle boxes, things of that nature. Um, and I'm certain welcome any questions that anyone has to clarify what we have going on. Certainly the proposal breaks down um, a number of things, but I'm happy to answer questions or clarify anything that is in the proposal. Okay, any questions of Mr. Anderson from the board? David got one question. This is coming through the Virginia Beach Judge. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. This, this is a Virginia Beach um, jail that they're getting the kids from, or their parents are in the Virginia Beach jail. They are in. Um, a variety of different jails. It can be Virginia Beach, it could be any of the local jails, or unfortunately, some of the um, parents have been sentenced to lengthy incarcerations in the Department of Corrections, and they could be anywhere over the state. Okay. Have you talked to Sheriff Smiley? Any? I have not. All right. Um, I'll be glad to set you up with an appointment with him if you'd like. Yes, sir. I'll Absolutely. try anyway. Let's put it that way. Yes, sir. All right. Give me a little bit of time. And I'll see what I can do to help you out with that. I appreciate that. All right. Any other any questions for David again from the board? Okay. Um, let me run back up to the top. Um, Knights of Columbus annual kids fishing day. Jim McCadden, seventy five hundred dollars. Mr. McCadden. Let's see. Where you he did just pop on. We may have lost him again. Okay. All right. All right. We'll go back down to item D. Uh, Children's Fishing Clinic, Rob Cowling, Newport News. All right. Let me get him unmuted. Mr. Cowling, you should be able to speak now. <laughs> Oh, hello there. How are you doing tonight? Good evening. We're good. It, uh, we're uh, kind of 
holding the plan the same way as we had hoped to do it for this year. Um, and it's nothing that we're going to make any changes on unless uh, nature is telling us to do something different. Um, obviously, we were unable to conduct one for 2020. And so the plan just moves over to 21. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure what you might want us to, to elaborate on that hasn't been done in the previous 24 years, but uh, uh, I'm disappointed. I was looking for the 25th to get a, <laughs> to get here and be done. <laughs> but but uh, that hasn't been the case. All right. Well, we'll keep our fingers crossed if you can get it in next go around. Um, I would hope so. Do you have any questions for Rob? Okay. Ed, we just to give you a little bit of a just a little bit of a background on why we everybody had to cancel. Newport News using Huntington Park was not granting any permits for gatherings. They wanted a social plan for distancing for 250 kids that, you know, how would we maintain six feet with kids that want to be together? Uh, if they gave the permit, which they weren't going to, the peer had no problem, but uh, since Snooper News was granting no access permits to the facility, it uh, said no, this wasn't going to happen. If anyone has any questions, I'll be glad to take them. I had to mute mine because somebody's running running a printer from up here from downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> So I had to send her a text and tell her to stop printing. Oh, uh, go ahead, Alicia. When we're finished with that item, um, I see Mr. McCadden is back on our attendees list. And when you're ready, I'll see if um, we can't get his audio working. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and do him now. So we, and hopefully we won't lose him again. All right. Let's try this. Mr. McCadden, can you try to speaking, please? Yeah, can you hear me? We can hear you. I will get your slide up one okay. moment. I'm sorry. I apologize, everybody. I was having a little trouble here. No problem. Um, so yeah, I apologize for my delay. But yeah, this is um, I just uh, put together. This was my slide from some photos from last year's event. And uh, we were trying very hard to I was trying very hard to have a reduced um, a reduced event um, but on this year, but unfortunately the, the Boys and Girls Club was, um, had reduced staffing and things like that. So we're, and the, um, it just, it didn't work out unfortunately. Um, so we're looking forward to next year. And um, so this was our, our actual attendance from, um, from 2019, but we always hope for at least uh, we plan on 200 kids and um, the chaperones, as you can see from each unit, uh, we work with eight units from the Boys and Girls Club of Southeast Virginia. And uh, our goal is just to put together a fun event um, for these kids. So for a lot of them, it's their first time fishing. And um, they get to walk home. They all come in their Boys and Girls Club shirts, as you can say, but they walk away with... Um, their kids fishing day shirts with um, all the logos of our sponsors, including the VMRC, um, and uh, and uh, they walk away with their uh, brand new fishing equipment. So um, they get to take and and of course there's uh, we provide them with lunch on the dock as well. So and uh, this is just a few um, few pictures. They they definitely enjoy catching the fish, and even if they catch and release, they they enjoy, um, they seem to, if every year they enjoy to you know, measure them and weigh them and, and document them properly, um, even if they're going to end up releasing them back uh, into the bay there. So um, just 
thank you. I thank the board and Alicia and everybody for your continued support and really looking forward to continuing this 2021. Any questions of Mr. Cadden? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Cadden. Uh, hopefully, we will be doing this type of meeting next, next go around, but I got a feeling we will. Okay. Uh, next one up is the. Um, Kiwanis Club Children's Fishing Clinic, Wesley Brown. I don't believe we have Wes Brown on. Okay. Um, or anyone from their group. Okay. Um, board members, you can read his presentation. It's pretty much the same as uh, last, the last X number of years we've been doing this. Uh, I think Rob, Rob's still on. If you have any questions on this one, he can probably answer them just as well as anybody. So, but maybe we'll have a look at this uh, next time. Okay. Item F, uh, Saxis and Morley's War, Children's Fishing and Conservation <laughs> Educational Outing, uh, Stephen Elliott. Uh, for $2,200. Mr. Elliott contacted me Friday um, and was really concerned with his internet capabilities at his house on the Eastern Shore. And so he asked that I relay this information, which is very similar to what they have done in past years. One of the big differences is that this year, and I believe they, they did were able to do this last year as well, is that they're going to be doing three events instead of two, and they're going to be at Morley's Wharf, Saxis, and Assateague Island. So I guess we should probably change the title of this for future years. And these, these are for children ages 6 to 15. I know in past years, they had gone a little bit younger. So this is now six to 15, I think more in line with what the board had requested. Um, they also are provided t-shirts, equipment, bottom tackle. They have club members accompanying them and, and giving them just general fishing education, safety education. Um, they're also, as most of our events, talking about the, juniors, the junior angler program, and they also get lunch and trophies for their biggest, longest fish. So he always notes in all of his presentations that those are the two poorest counties in Virginia and that they are really reaching out to the youth of the Eastern Shore and that they appreciate the past support of the MRC and look forward to future support from the agency. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. And once again, if anybody has any specific questions, Mr. Elliott and all of our Fishing event coordinators, if they were not able to attend, are perfectly willing to answer questions. Just email them to me and I'll pass them along. Oops. All right. There we are. Thank mm -hmm. you, ma'am. All right. Well, uh, Norfolk headboat fishing trip, uh, Ike Eisenhower, $1,200. Mr. Eisenhower, you're here. Yes. Good evening. Um, glad to be here. Assuming you can hear me fine. We can. Thank you. All right. Um, well, uh, unfortunately, because of COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we were not able to hold the head boat fishing trip as we planned, which was actually planned for next week. And uh, the um, restrictions and the transition from third to the second level uh, by the governor basically shut down the uh, rec center. So we were planning on having a good time as we have for the last seven years and taking those kids uh, age of nine to 14 out on the head boat to the fan. And, uh, but of course, head boat uh, fishing requires a lot of close contact, so we knew we had some problem with that and even considered cutting down on the amount of kids we normally have 
between 45 and 50 kids in there and at least 15 to 20 uh, adults supervising. So that didn't seem to uh, be possible at all. So we're considering canceling anyway, even if there had not been the uh, change in the level of the pandemic restrictions. So we're planning for next year, the same thing that we've done the last seven years, uh, take kids out, get them on a head boat. Uh, these kids, um, we, we do have several kids that have been coming for several years and very familiar with what we're doing and they look forward to it the whole year. Uh, in the spring and, and early summertime, they just build up a momentum of anticipation. And uh, we've actually been able to watch these kids grow uh, over the years. It's been a lot of fun contact with them. We have other events with this, uh, this uh, rep center. We frequently take them uh, at least a couple of times a year out on the pier and we, you know, and fish with them and supervise their fishing on the pier. And then of course have uh, uh, hot dogs and hamburgers uh, afterwards. And of course, that's what we were planning for this year and we'll be doing the same thing next year. But of course, we'll have to adapt to whatever uh, restrictions uh, COVID-19 leaves us. So, but I, we, we are hoping for the best for next year. Okay, we are good. Any questions? Yep. Any questions from Mr. Eisenhower from the board? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Making the effort to be online with us. Uh, you're welcome. Our next is item eight. Sun 21 Sunshine Children's Fishing Program, Denny Dobbin, 9904. Alicia, is he on board? I don't believe he is. Mr. Dobbins, if you're on, I haven't seen you yet. Yeah, he, I don't believe he's on. Um, I did speak with him on Friday, and I know he was a little bit concerned about being able to log on. Okay. He has canceled their 2020 events and are just trying to make plans for 2021. All right. All right. Next item is any game fish tagging for 2021. Susanna Music and Lewis Gillingham, $88,806. All right. One moment. I will get your PowerPoint up. Thanks, Alicia. Good afternoon. Hello, oh, everybody. I miss seeing everybody in person. I hope everybody's doing well. How's your son doing? He's hanging there. He's still breathing, so, you know, job done. Okay. <laughs> is he going to have to go back to school or is he going to virtual school? Um, so far, it's going to be virtual. We're in York County, and so they've said first nine weeks virtual, but who knows? Okay. We're hanging in there, and I'm 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 grateful. Everybody's healthy so far, and that's all we can ask for. That's, that's a good thing. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Okay. I think Alicia's ready, so you got the floor. All righty. Thank you all for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. I'm sorry we can't be together in person to talk about the checking program proposal. I'll try and keep it short and sweet. Pretty much the proposal is exactly the same as all of our previous years. Um, I will give you some highlights over the last year, what we've been able to accomplish. In terms of tagging program data, we've had more than 24,000 fishes were tagged last year and um, over 1,300 captures. So we had an increase in tagging of almost 37%, which was great. And now this year, the um, year 2020 is actually our 25th year for the tagging program, which is wonderful. So those to um, 
the anglers who have made it possible, and of course, the saltwater fishing fund for making it possible. Um, but we've had more than 344,000 tags and over 35,000 recaptures as well. And of course, um, speckled trout have snuck in there in the last couple of years to the, the top position as our most popular tagging species. So for over the past 25 years, we've had more than 112,000 of those tagged, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, so moving on to the next thing, I'm gonna give you a little snapshot of folks who have actually looked at our data online. Thanks, Alicia. Um, this is something cool that we can do now with our annual reports. We have it logged into a special system that anytime the link is accessed anywhere, we have a record of it. So this shows us the global access for our um, tagging report from 2018. You can see it's pretty globally distributed, which is exciting. Of course, most of the access points happen in the United States and the East Coast and around Virginia. But it's nice to see that um, more people than are ever checking out the report. Um, and in those, um, and along those lines, um, that brings us to our next slide. Alicia, thank you. Um, one of the things that we have bravely delved into during quarantine was establishing a social media presence. So we finally joined Facebook carefully um, with a um, celebration of our 25th year and asking folks to post or send me photos of their best tagged fish pictures. And it's been really successful. We were also able to hold our annual award ceremony online and usually we have it at Bass Pro. They were still big supporters of the awards program. They gave all of our awardees some um, prizes, but we did it live via Zoom and Facebook. And we've had more than 209 people watch that video. So it was actually a great opportunity for the tagging program to broaden our scope there and have a real even broader participation than we would if we were able to hold it in person as we usually would. Um, so going back to the Facebook page, we um, broke ground for that on June 16th. And since then, we have have about a 75% response rate, which is pretty good. We have 78 followers. And just since I sent Alicia these slides, we've actually broken our max reach with our posts. So um, we've now had more than 783 people check out at least one post. Um, so I think it's surprisingly done pretty well. It was something I was, I'm, I'm not on social media myself. So we're, people have been great and patient with us. And so far it seems to be doing well. Um, so in other good news, we've been able to meet all of our other deliverables for the program this year, despite COVID, everything got postponed and, um, Huge kudos to Lewis and all of our partners for actually making the training workshops possible. Um, we just had to do it a different way this year. So we had a hybrid training class with some of it online. The lecture component was online and we held um, two classes in person in very small groups and um, outdoors. Everybody had their own PPE. And we were able to get new people in the program this year under those conditions. And we had about the same amount of people decide to defer to next year because of COVID. Um, so I'm really pleased that we were able to get some new folks into the program and it was a good trial run for using that hybrid technique in the small group setting. Um, if hopefully we won't, but just in case we have to adopt the same protocol for training for next year. So I think that's it for me. I don't know if Lewis has anything else he wants to add, but I'm I'm happy to take any questions. Did, 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 please tell me you heard some of that. Yeah. It's very quiet. Well, Mr. Had, I, I had <laughs> Lewis, did you want to speak? I was, going to, I was at least going to say, well, I got the chance to do my first two Zoom uh, 
deals the, uh, uh, the, between now. Actually, it was just no, we did two days. That's right. We did the the uh, lecture part on two days, and that was. I've now zoomed, and the, I, the workshop. I thought the tag new taggers missed out on the expertise that we usually get through our volunteers that some of them have literally thousands for us. But um, I did get to know, and I think Susanna did too, get to know each one of them a little bit more individually than typically we would with the workshop. So it, it was kind of a wash. I, I think they felt like they were, knew what they knew what they needed to do. And I I'm, I'm, was impressed with the group, although small, um, I was impressed with the group overall. Okay. Thank you, sir. Anybody on the board have any questions for either Susanna or Lewis? Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next is item J, Young of the Year, American Eel in Virginia, and that's uh, Dr. Fabrizio. And I am getting your presentation up right now, Dr. Fabrizio. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Alicia. Um, hello, everyone, and thanks for um, hosting this virtual meeting. These are always challenging, but um, I think it's going really well. Um, so tonight, I just want to talk a little bit about a project that we started a long time ago um, in Chesapeake Bay, and it's proving to be a really important uh, one. So could we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so this is what we've been doing at VIMS um, annually since 2000. We have been estimating recruitment or the supply of these young uh, American eels, which we call the glass eel. It's a glass eel because it looks like glass. You can see through it pretty much. Um, they're small eels that um, return or come into the estuaries in Virginia. We sample three sites in Virginia, and you can see them on the map there, Wareham's Pond on the James River, Wormley Pond on the York River, and Camp's Mill Pond on the Rappahannock River. Um, and these are the time series of glass eel abundances for those three areas. Wormley Pond by far is the most productive uh, one. Um, I don't know, can you see my cursor if I move this around? Don't no. Okay, that's fine. All right. Yeah, so these are just the time series. Wanted to show you that um, we, we have um, a long series of information for these glass eels. So this is 2000 to 2019. Um, we could go to the next slide, please. So one thing I wanted to do is give you an update for 2020. You all funded us uh, for this year. And fortunately, we did not have any um, setbacks or delays due to COVID-19. We mostly sample between January and mainly May, May and June. And we were able to do this safely um, without um, jeopardizing the health or well-being of any of our staff. So we were able to continue with our um, sample collection in 2020. And right now, um, the data entry is underway. So I don't have the 2020 results to show you, but um, we do have them. And if we could go to the last slide, please. So this is just a summary of where we are with American Eel and why it's important to continue this. Uh, back in 2014, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature which is a uh, worldwide organization that looks at endangered and threatened species um, this group listed the American eel as endangered and put them on what's called the red list. 
Uh, the year after that, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service determined that American eel is stable and doesn't warrant listing under the Endangered Species Act. But the um, last stock assessment for American eel, which was performed under the auspices of the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, found that the stock was depleted. Um, last or two years ago now, 2018, uh, an, an addendum was passed uh, by the American Eel Board and this um, addendum was basically adjusting the management trigger for, um, for the species. Uh, right now, we're in the process of conducting an, a benchmark stock assessment. Uh, so that process is underway. It's gonna be a two year process Starting this year, uh, Troy Tucky, who is who works with me, and I, I know many of you met him before. He is the chair of the um, committee, the technical committee for American Eel, and he will be um, leading the assessment for American Eel. And all of the data that VIMS collects, all of the data that you have um, generously supported in the past, will be part of that assessment and uh, represent important information. And then finally, I just want to end by saying um, that this proposal was submitted not only here to the Saltwater Recreational Fishing Development Fund, but we also submitted the same proposal to the Commercial Marine Fishing Improvement Fund. And I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, anybody have any questions for Dr. Fabrizio? I have one question. All right, Mr. Randolph, go ahead. Uh, I'm a little bit confused with the last part of this statement. Um, are the eels uh, endangered or are they not? So that term endangered is, is a very specific term that's used by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, in our country, no, they're not considered endangered. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. And, and this has definitely been a challenge, like you said. All right, um, federal assistance uh, matching funds. That's the yeah. MRC. Uh, I will be doing that one. I kind of figured you were. <laughs> there we go. All right, all right. Move the it's, a, it's all yours. It's all yours. Sounds good. So you all have all seen this before. Um, we have, we call it federal assistance, but it's really part of the Sport Fish Restoration Program. And that is an excise tax program. It's a federal program that we do a lot of our research with. Um, funds are matched for three federal dollars to every state dollar. So every state dollar that gets put in gets matched three to one. And the requested funds here, the total, it's taken both from the recreational fund and from the commercial fund. And the total match that we request is not the entire match. Our six projects that we're currently working with under this fund are listed and five of those we work with them and they provide some of the match as well. So we are not asking for the full match, just the portion that is VMRC's portion of that match. Two of these projects, actually Dr. Fabrizio is the PI on them. So if you have any questions, I'm sure she'd be willing to answer as well. What we've requested here is what we expect for a typical year. Now, given what we've seen in 2020, it has been far from a typical year. There were already challenges with budgeting these projects because of federal budget cuts two years ago were causing a lot of big challenges. Combining that with some of the changes from COVID, we are expecting there to be budgetary changes between that and the state budget and everything else. So some of these programs are um, working through some big challenges. The best we can do as far as planning is to go ahead and request the full amount from you all 
and move forward because it will take some time to realize what changes we may see in these projects. It is important to note that if for some reason we don't spend these funds, then these will simply roll over. So if we have a large unspent balance here, it just means that we will request less in subsequent years. And I am happy to answer any questions. Any questions, Alicia? Alicia, so what you're saying is what's not spent will just stay in the bank and be used back to go around? Correct. Okay. All right. Not hearing any questions. Next up is reconstruction of the saltwater fishing pier on the Severn River, Louis Lawrence. $50,000. All right. Mr. Lawrence, can you speak to make sure that we can hear you? All right, let's try that again. Mr. Lawrence, can you try speaking for us, please? There you go. Now you. There you are. I hear you. All right, let me go ahead and get your presentation up. Right. Good evening, Mr. Rose. Good to see you again. It's been quite a few uh, years since we've been in front of you all. Yeah, it has been. Good to see you too. Yes, sir. All right. We're going to talk about a project off the Mobjack Bay on the Severn River. The application is brought to you by the Middle Peninsula Chesapeake Bay Public Access Authority. Uh, the authority was enabled by the General Assembly in 2003. It was the first one in the Commonwealth. It's expressly enabled to bring uh, public water recreational solutions back to the constituents, in this case, within the Middle Peninsula PDC. Next slide, please, Alicia. Mm -hmm. So the complex that we're looking at here is uh, just off the Severn River. As soon as you come into mouth on the right-hand side, it is a 100-acre piece of property that was donated to the authority um, maybe about a little less than 10 years ago. This was a $1.2 million donation. It came with an 8,000 square foot house, pools, barns, outbuildings, some boat ramp, um, ample parking. We immediately moved the Gloucester crew team in there into one of the buildings. They have about $2 million worth of shell boats. So every day when the school was in session, they would drive down and about 50 kids would get out and they launch their shell, their crew boats and do their practice off of the facility. Immediately, they had a problem getting to the water. So they were having to walk through the marsh. Uh, so we got a small grant from the Coastal Zone Management Program to build a floating pier, which we will see in the upcoming slide that they use and the canoe and kayakers use. Uh, unfortunately, the pier that came with the donation its life expectancy is now completely gone. And one of the tropical storms last summer took it out. Next slide, please. Okay, so you can see uh, upper left-hand side is the house that was donated with some fountains, beautiful waterfront property. Uh, you can see on the lower right-hand side, the uh, floating dock that was built for the crew team. Actually, that was completely done with parent labor. Uh, we bought the lumber with the grant from this coastal zone management program and the parents went down and built it. And you can see in the upper right-hand corner, the public fishing pier area that we need to rebuild. Next slide, please. So when we took uh, title to the property, the pier was functional and operational, but as you can see now, the storm has taken out quite a few sections of the pier. Uh, so we have very, we have no ability to use it any longer at all. Next slide, please. So um, get, well, give me some background about how many people in Gloucester have a recreational sport fishing license, a little less than a thousand. We've got about another thousand across the middle peninsula. And this is the only saltwater fishing pier on the Mobjack or any of the contributing tributaries. The only other closest one is at Gloucester Point. And then the only other public fishing pier in the middle peninsula is going to be all the way up in West Point. We talked earlier about the floating dock that was there to launch uh, canoes and kayaks. Uh, so you can go on to the next slide, please. And this is what we are proposing, uh, nothing very elaborate. We wanna try to do an open pile pier construction, You know, try to keep the footprint as small as possible, maybe four feet wide, have some siding running down both sides. The roof of the existing pier 
looks like it's still useful. The Marine contractor looked at it and said he thought it was still good. Those pylons were a little bit larger. So if possible, we want to try to maintain that and then add on the T to that so that folks would also have the ability to fish under covered shelter as well. Next slide, please. And we got some pictures of some of the general public and kids that were out using it while the, before the pier uh, washed away. What we didn't anticipate were the elderly. We had a lot of folks that were senior citizens that were coming down, uh, obviously providing access in rural communities to the water is a big problem. Uh, so we were glad to see that we had some senior citizens that had been using the facility and uh, they weren't happy when the storm took it out because they had no place to fish anymore. Next slide, please. And a bunch of kid pictures as well for folks that are getting in. Spot does really well for uh, striped bass, puppy drum in the fall, speckled trout in the spring. Uh, pretty much people were catching fish off that dock year round. Uh, so when it blew out from the storm, we, had, we needed to get it replaced. And so that's why we are bringing the proposal back to you all right now. The access authority is bringing in about $40,000 in cash. And I think we're asking you all for 50. Be glad to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you, Louie. Yes, sir. Uh, anybody have any questions for Louie? All right. I got, I got one. Yes, sir. Where is this in relationship to uh, Jellystone Park? So if you were to uh, head out the end of the dock and then hang a right, and you would go probably about uh, oh. two miles up, you'd pass the Marina, Severn River Marina. And then you go about another 500 yards past the marina, and that's where Jellystone is. The Access Authority does also own a small piece of property that's maybe about a half a mile from Jellystone, which we make available for those folks that are there camping to be able to paddle out, canoe, kayak down to. Uh, so we try to incorporate and make all of our holdings on the Severn work in conjunction with existing campgrounds so that they know where they are, how people can access them, take advantage of the public investment. Okay, and um, it's my understanding that you've got a peer license? Uh, we will have a peer license, yes, sir. Okay. All right, and it'll be ADA compliant? It'll be at compliant as what building code requires, yes, sir. Okay, I'm just asking. No, that's correct. No, it's a good question. Absolutely. And we need it because we don't, we've got all different types of people that use facility. Okay. All right. Any questions? I have one. Mr. Randolph, it's all yours. Are permits to uh, build a pier uh, applying in this situation since um, they're rebuilding one? I assume they had to the permits at one point. Yes, sir. So my staff has already started the JPA. Uh, since we are a public entity, the permit would go directly to VMRC and not to the local wetlands board. Uh, so we would be working directly uh, with Alicia and the staff there as this project moves forward. I know my staff has completed, I think they completed the JPA this week. I took a, I took a review of it earlier. I don't know if they've transmitted it to Alicia yet or not. Uh, but we would be working in close concert with VMRC uh, to process the application. Thank you. Yes, sir. What about the Corps engineers? Do you have to deal with them? The joint permit would kick that out. We'll okay. probably have essential fish habitat um, construction windows. When we got the permit for the floating dock next door to this one, we bumped into the central fish habitat time of year restrictions. And so I would yeah. assume this would have it too, since it's only about 40 feet away from the two piers. Yeah, I would, I would think so. I had that written down as a question. Yes, and we're, and we're comfortable with that. I and mean, we've got a parallel example now uh, for that little small pier that was done. And so we have a general idea of what the restrictions are gonna be. Okay, any other questions? I just have a comment for those questions about the JPA, um, the joint permit application. So that is an entirely separate process from ours. I've talked with Mr. Lawrence. He's well aware of the, of the requirements on that. I've also spoke with the environmental engineer who will be handling that. That's Mike Johnson with our agency. So he will be working with them. And I mean, I will be, if, if I'm asked as well, 
He'll be working with them on that side of it while we'll be working on the funding side of it. So the only time those really come together is when you do a final vote and that JPA may not be completed yet, which is okay. We would just be having a vote that would be pending review of that JPA or pending approval of that joint permit application. And that can go all the way through the commission like that. And that's frequent if they have a delay, it doesn't stop our process. So just keep in mind those two are very, they're on the same project. So of course they're related, but they are a little bit separate as far as how they work with our agency. Okay. Any other questions, comments? You guys are mighty quiet tonight. <laughs> I'm surprised Mr. Holland hadn't spoken up. You're doing a good job. I don't, no, nothing to say. Okay, you say so. <laughs> Louie, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Good talking with you again. All right, same here, and we'll be in touch, I'm sure. All righty. All right, Alicia. That yes, sir. That concludes the agenda. We've got a couple of folks that uh, didn't make it this time, so they'll get it. They'll get a shot at it next time. Uh, have you got a date in mind? I do not. I'll need to work with the agency on that. I it will be at least next month, no sooner than the second Monday of September. Okay, that's fine. But I will. I will send out meeting dates when I have them, and I do apologize for our bouncing meeting dates over the last few months. Uh, you know, we we understand the issue and we work work around it and get it done. Uh, and that's that's everybody just needs to realize that. So, all right, any other questions? Uh, anything for the good of the order from anybody? Not hearing anything. Uh, I'll see. I don't even. It's six fifty-seven. I can't believe we got through this whole thing in an hour. Uh, that's good. That's because it's a good chance. <laughs> <laughs> I think the thing is, the first part of it we've heard it so many times. <laughs> so. All right, there being All right, nothing. Mr. Cameron, I, I move we adjourn. All right, is there a second? No, I'll second it. I mean, Jesse. All right. Got a motion and a second. Uh, Mr. Holland and Mr. Jesse. And all in favor. And we're, we're not even going to take a roll on this one. Just everybody say aye if you want to get out. Aye. 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 <laughs> motion carried. We are now adjourned. Thank you all for partaking of this meeting. Thank you. You did a great Thanks, job. Thank you. Thank you. Alicia, call me when you get a chance. Will do.